Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. And we indeed want to proclaim what is true and right about you. And we will never grow weary of doing such as the depth of your greatness is inexhaustible. We thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going to be doing a intro, an intro to the book of Colossians. You can open up your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. And over the next several weeks and few months, we will be working our way through this wonderful book, this means of grace from God for us. And God is truly marvelous. He really is. About five months ago, I... Um, with some of the elders, made the decision to preach through the book of Colossians. If, uh, if Smed was going to be taking a sabbatical, which he is this summer, and I had no idea at that point of a global pandemic. I had no idea of the heartbreaking deaths of Ahmad Aubrey and George Floyd and many others. The social implications of these situations had no idea of the current nature of fear and anxiousness and hurt and anger and grief and disunity and confusion of faint-heartedness and weariness, all that exists currently in many. And I'm confident we would marvel at the sufficiency of God's word and the applicability of God's word to our circumstances, regardless of where we found ourselves in God's word, but I'm especially excited to spend some time together in the book of Colossians. And the book of Colossians is presented such a robust, clear, exalted view of Christ. In this book, we see Jesus. We see his supremacy. We see his superiority. We see his sufficiency. We see Jesus in chapter one, his relation to salvation. We see Jesus in his relation to creation. We see Jesus' relation to authority, that all authority has been given to him. We see Jesus' relation to the church, that he is the head of the church. We see Jesus' relation to the Christian walk in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. We see the difference that Jesus makes in the life of a believer who is putting off the old way of life and putting on the new in chapter 3, verse 3 and 3, 10 and so on. We see Jesus in his relationship to personal relationships. In chapter three, believers, friends, siblings, parents, masters, slaves. We see Jesus' relation to eternity in 3, 4, in the anticipation of when we will be with him, like him, in glory. You see, a right thinking of Jesus leaves no part of our lives unaffected. A right view of Jesus will only aid us in every area of life. Every hardship, every pain, every hurt, every struggle, every offense, every triumph, every victory. And this morning, we're going to briefly look at the first two verses of the book of Colossians, which will help set the stage for us. And then we're going to walk through a summary of the book of Colossians. So read with me as we begin Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We're going to start by looking at the author of the book of Colossians, the author of Colossians. Paul introduces himself as the author of the book and draws attention to the fact that Timothy, our brother, is with him. Paul is writing this letter from prison, as he references in chapter 4, and this is likely during his first imprisonment in Rome between 60 and 62 AD. During this time, he receives word from Epaphras who comes to Paul, and based on what we see in chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul says, just as you learned it, that is the gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, it appears that Epaphras is the founder of the church in Colossae. 
Epaphras has reported the state of the church, which in part is very encouraging. But with that, he also reports that there are challenges facing the believers there as they sought to continue faithfully in the way of Christ. So Epaphras comes to Paul for spiritual guidance and input to reinforce and strengthen the Colossians in truths they seem to already know, at least in part. That they would be strengthened in their faith and resolved in their faithfulness. And Paul, you can see in verse 1, introduces himself as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He is on full authority of God. Paul reinforces his God-given authority to speak to them regarding the things of the Lord. And there, there's a weight to this introduction that demonstrates his authority to speak to the opposition and to the false teaching that the believers in Colossae were being faced with, with the false teaching that was being propagated. He's speaking in heartfelt love to believers he has not met on divine authority as a messenger by the will of God. And it's interesting to note that at a time of spiritual attack and very real threats to the spiritual integrity of the church in Colossae, what God brings to them is scripture. He didn't bring someone to come and walk with them in their difficulties. He didn't bring someone to sit and hear all of their hardships. He brought predominantly the word of God. Now, this is an observation for the benefit of the one struggling to not be deceived. It's an observation for that one to think and believe that scripture indeed is sufficient. Paul actually wanted to be there with them, but his very real own personal trials prohibited him from being there. And where we can walk with others in their affliction, in their struggles, in their spiritual dangers, in their vulnerabilities, we should, absolutely. But our greatest aid in serving those in need in their greatest hardships, their greatest help will be God's word. The most loving thing we can do is point one another to God's word, to God's wisdom, in times of trouble, in times of threat. And maybe you've ever felt this, this sentiment where someone brought God's word to you and you thought, well, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know that in response to God's word. And then in your heart, make demands on what you think you need or what things should be included in someone's care for you outside of God's word. We should be very careful with that kind of thinking Paul here also references Timothy. He reference, references others later in the book in chapter four. But if you look again at verse one, he says Paul and then adds and Timothy, our brother. And this inclusion of Timothy doesn't detract from the personal ownership of the letter of Paul and its contents. Timothy is with him. T Timothy was a precious co-laborer and a son of Paul in the faith. Now, as we move into verse two, we see the recipient of the book of Colossians. So first we looked at the author. Now we're gonna make some observations about the recipients. Look at verse two. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Paul refers to the believers in Colossae as saints and faithful brethren in Christ. Not to get too nerdy here, but the construction of the Greek makes it conclusive. He's referring to one group of people. He's not referring to the saints in Colossae. And in addition to the saints, the faithful brethren, he's using these terms to summarize the whole of the group of believers in Colossae. So he says, the saints and the faithful brethren. Now the saints, the meaning of the word saint here is simply set apart ones. Those set apart by Christ who are faithful, who are walking in faithfulness in Christ in Colossae. Now a little bit about the town of Colossae, the city of Colossae. It was a region of Phrygia in the Roman province of Asia. In, in what is now part of Turkey, about 100 miles from Ephesus, yet was over 1,000 miles from Rome where Paul is writing. Colossae was a smaller, somewhat insignificant community off the beaten path. They were known for their wool, while at one time they were more pro prominent. At this time, there was nothing significantly prestigious about them. 
about this city, yet the gospel had come to them, and they were in Christ, and they needed spiritual care. And so Paul, hearing of their need, writes. The church in Colossae, most likely having been in existence for about five years, seems to have been established by Epaphras while Paul was ministering in Ephesus. And Epaphras was a a faithful brother and was faithful in teaching them, yet as they were facing false teaching and spiritual trials, Epaphras sets out to visit Paul, reporting, reporting both their progress in the faith, in the faith and the threats that they were facing. And these threats that sought to distort and redefine and misconstrue and alter the person of Jesus was not only threatening the theology of the church, but the practice of the church as well. As practice always flows from conviction and how you live flows from what you actually believe. So Paul ends his greeting with a brief statement that while common in his letters is not inconsequential. Look at the end of verse two. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The word grace sums up that which all, sums up that all that which comes to us from God is a free unmerited gift. And the word peace communicates not the tranquility of life, but the wholeness of life at rest with God. This is what God brings as a loving father for all those who are his, not a tranquility or an ease of earthly circumstances, but a peace for the soul before a holy God. So with these things in mind, let's transition and end this morning with a summary of the book of Colossians. The summary of Colossians. Summary of the book of Colossians is this. An unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ fortifies faith and enables faithfulness in the believer. An unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ fortifies faith and enables faithfulness in the believer. Let's break this summary down a bit, phrase by phrase. First, we see an unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. We see this very clearly as Paul sets forth the greatness of Jesus Christ in chapter one of the book of Colossians. And Paul is not bringing the gospel to them For the first time, they've learned it from Epaphras, but he is reinforcing them in the teaching pertaining to Jesus that they would be strengthened with an unwavering conviction and immovable faith in both the supremacy, the greatness, the preeminence of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ for all that the believer needs. Everything has its appropriate place, but everything's appropriate place is somewhere underneath Jesus. He is supreme. Colossians, we see the greatness of Christ put forth clearly that he is the substance and reality of God's purposes and grace. There is a Christ-exalting focus that is to be a part of every believer's life. Jesus is truly Amazing, he is the pattern that we are being made into. Christ overcomes all earthly bound distinctions that separate people. He has forgiven us all of our sins. His word is to be the substance of our thoughts, the meditations of our heart, the contents of our songs, the focus of our conversations, the substance of our corporate worship. His name is to be on every deed that we do, we do all in the name of Jesus. There's a Christ-exalting focus in everything for the believer. This is a stark contrast to the world. If the things we are advocating for, if the things we are living for, if the manner in which we are advocating for them is indistinguishable from the world and not done in the name of Jesus, we have need for personal evaluation. And Colossians will teach us this. Jesus reigns supreme throughout the whole letter and Christ is wholly sufficient. It is not Christ and additional things. We also see then that this unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, it fortifies the faith for the believer. 
It fortifies our faith in Jesus as we think rightly about the reality of who Jesus is. The best safeguard against bad theology is a robust good theology. This unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ strengthens and creates a hedge of protection of the mind and of the heart against those who would preach a false view of Christ. Christ is the channel from which every Christian doctrine and practice must flow. And then lastly, an unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ not only fortifies our faith, but it enables faithfulness in the believer that we would walk in accordance with the things that we profess in our, with our mouths and that we believe in our hearts. It enables faithfulness in the believer. Paul's not only concerned with what the Colossians believe, but he's concerned with how they live in light of the truth that they know. Yet the best way to advocate for the faithfulness in their walk, that they would walk in Christ, is that they be firmly rooted and built up and established in him. Look at chapter two, verse six. Chapter two, verse six. We come to the first imperative In the book of Colossians, and Paul says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And then verse 7, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. An advocacy of scripture for right thinking about God, the gospel, and Jesus is never a hindrance to appropriate godly living but an advocacy, enablement, and means of grace from God to walk in Christ. It is good to be built up in Christ as we seek to do all things for the glory of God in the name of Jesus. And so we find in every fear, we can trust God. We can look to him. We can find comfort. We can find hope because of what we know to be true about Christ. And then how we navigate those things is uniquely different because we are doing so for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. See, if every fear was dispelled, every difficulty lessened, every social ill righted, every emotional hurt empathized with, every injustice punished, but Christ wasn't exalted, and the gospel wasn't proclaimed, and disciples aren't made, then the church is failing. It must be about Christ, for the name of Christ, for the glory of Christ, in the power of Christ. And yet the implications of embracing Christ is a supernatural love for others that feels compassion. It it demonstrates love. And we need God's spirit to help fix our hearts and our minds on the right things And we need God's spirit to help us walk in love. We see that in chapter three, verse 15, where we are called to have Christ rule in our hearts. This is on the heels of love being the perfect bond of unity in the body of Christ. Paul specifically draws out the implications of the gospel that he puts forth so wonderfully about the nature of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished He puts it forth and then he points the believer to consider their members dead to immorality, impurity in chapter three, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry and tells them to also put aside anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech. And rather in light of who Jesus is and what he's done in the gospel, as we set our minds on things above, we put on a heart of compassion of kindness, of humility, of gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint. And beyond all these things, as I mentioned a moment moment ago, we put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We cannot let the circumstances around us deter us from love for each other. We need that. And as things pull against us, seeking to create disunity among us, we must be bound in love. And this is a supernatural love that can only come from knowing the love of God demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ. And as that happens, 
We let the peace of Christ, we are called to do this, to have the peace of Christ rule our hearts as we are called to one body and we are to be thankful. In the midst of anxieties, fears, disappointments, conflicts, has the peace of Christ ruled your heart this week? Have you been thankful? I'm confident that the book of Colossians over the coming weeks and months is going to be an incredible means of God's grace to us so that we might walk in Christ as Paul calls the Colossians to do in chapter two, verse six. And we know why Paul labors. He wants to see every believer made complete in Christ. And that should be our desire for ourselves. And that should be our desire for one another, that we would be mature in Christ, that Christ would be honored in all of our thoughts, in all of our actions. Colossians will help us have an unwavering conviction regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ that, Lord willing, will fortify our faith and enable faithfulness in us as we seek to walk in Christ. Let's pray. We're not gonna end with the last song this morning. I'm gonna close our time in prayer and then we'll dismiss. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we could be together this morning again. We think of those who are still yet unable to join us. We pray that they would be comforted and strengthened in the Lord, that we would be active to pursue them in the ways that we can. That would be a blessing to them Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, to hear your word, and to live out your word as we make our way through this precious book that you have given to us. Help us to see you as you are, as you have revealed yourself. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.